Welcome to Nature Calls, Conversations from the Hudson Valley. Our team's goal is to present science-based information about gardening and all things nature in New York's Hudson Valley. Host Jean and Tim, along with team members Teresa and Linda, are master gardener volunteers for New York's Columbia and Green Counties. So if you're interested in gardening or nature or nuggets of information about what's happening outside your door, settle in. Enjoy the conversation. Whatever the season, we have something to say. Hi, I'm Jean Thomas. And I'm Annie Skabinski, and welcome to Nature Calls, Conversations from the Hudson Valley. Today, we're talking to Rebecca Smith Aldrich. Rebecca, M L S L E E D A P, is Executive Director of the Mid Hudson Library System and has spent over 20 years working with our public libraries in the areas of governance, management, funding, and facilities. Her specialty is helping libraries create sustainable solutions for their facilities, funding, and leadership, and she has the credentials to back it up. She's a certified sustainable building advisor, an accredited professional in leadership in energy and environmental design, and holds an advanced certificate in public library administration from the Palmer School of Library and Information Science, where now she's also an adjunct professor. That's a lot. You forgot to mention that she's authored and co-authored over 20 publications, writes a regular column on sustainability for Library Journal, which named her a mover and shaker, and is the co-founder of the award-winning Sustainable Libraries Initiative. Today she's here to talk about the Library of Local and rest up, I guess, a little. Welcome, Rebecca. (laughs) Thanks, Jean. Thanks, Annie. Happy to be here. Will you start by defining for our listeners what the Library of Local is? Absolutely. So the Library of Local was born out of some very exciting conversations between myself and the founders of uh, Climate Partners for Climate Action in the Hudson Valley. And we were talking about how to really catalyze community resilience by using libraries as the platform for that work. So through those conversations, they were generous enough to donate, to create what we ended up calling the Library of Local, which resulted in specialized collections in a number of libraries around the Hudson Valley that focus on books, tool lending libraries, seed lending libraries, as well as programming specific to work in the areas of climate action, ecological restoration, and a couple other things as well. What is the Partners for Climate Action Hudson Valley? So it's a group of concerned citizens that really want to see climate action accelerated in the Hudson Valley. So they've been using funds that they were able to procure from grant makers to invest in specific projects that help to, I think, really speak to the urgency of the need for climate action. So, for instance, they invested in helping what they call the Local Champions Project, which supports champions that are working in towns that are climate smart communities that are using the state program on climate smart communities um, to really accelerate their work and get them maybe across the finish line a little faster so we can see results faster. Oh, Tim's going to wish he was here. He is That's his expertise. He's, he's definitely into the natives and all of that cool stuff. That's, that's cool. You talked about all the things you could borrow from the Library of Local. You said you could borrow tools. Can I borrow a bowl planner? You can, along with a, a pretty phenomenal list of other items that are available. So I'm certainly not a gardener. I want to admit that up front to you both. But uh, when I took a look at what the libraries are lending right now, I was at the Kingston Library recently, and they've got all the tools up on the wall, which is pretty cool to see. Okay. But you can borrow stuff like soil samplers, soil knife, compost thermometer, hand weeder, cultivator, pickaxe, a lot of pretty cool stuff that maybe you only need once or twice in a season, and you don't really need to own, but you can borrow at the library. <gasps> My crime writer jeans kicking in. <laughs> <laughs> Would that be the coolest? You could like rent your weapon. Stop, stop. Okay. My library, I'm in Greenville. Mm-hmm. Greenville is the very, very outskirts of the district, of course. We're like 15 minutes from Albany. They have a seat library that the local people have put together. Can they like apply for a grant to participate in this? Is that how you do it? How, how, does the, how would they participate? 
that's how we got started. We had a first year kind of a, a pilot program where libraries applied to be part of it. The funder gave us funding for a second year of that and really expanded the program. Um, this year, we're not taking on new libraries of local, but we're teaching the other libraries that weren't part of the first two years how they could follow suit if they wanted to, and they can certainly find other grant money to make that happen if they'd like to. Yeah, I know they're very active. I mean, they're just wall to wall. I don't know how any library manages to add anything. Exactly. They are yeah. all so busy. There were a lot of libraries who wanted to be part of the first two years, but they yeah. just really didn't have the space for the dedicated collection area and to house all the tools. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. So if my library is not a library of local, can I still borrow a bulb planner? Yeah, you can come down to one of the specific locations and borrow it on site, but we're not going to transport it through the van system the way we do the physical like items like books. I was wondering if Jean was going to get her pickaxe delivered. <laughs> Send out for my weapons. <laughs> now we're going to get you on the security camera coming in to get that. So. Well, that's the thing. Okay, good to know. So why do you call it an LOL? I just keep looking at that and saying, oh, laugh out loud. So is that intentional to be cheerful? <laughs> well, we went around and around about what to call them. We started calling them community resilience hubs, and we thought, are people really going to understand what we're talking yeah. about? And more and more, we got into the philosophy behind what we were trying to do. It's not just about those collections of books and seeds and tools. It's really about helping people in the community come together and learn together and respect the wisdom that is right there in our local neighborhoods. So we really started to get excited about the idea of these programs and tools and collections really being the catalyst to bring people together, to learn from one another, to learn together, and to do projects together that were going to really benefit the local community. Because what we've learned over time with climate action is that, yes, you know, we're excited about the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals and thinking about policy making at a global level. But really, until people at the local level understand what has to be done and how climate change is going to specifically, I think, impact their town, their neighborhood, they're not as motivated to come together and work together. So libraries, I think, can raise the profile of the need for climate action. They can find the wisdom in our communities of folks like yourselves, master gardeners or master beekeepers, whatever the expertise is, and bring that to the surface just the way we do collections and the way we curate programs for people in our community. So the idea of really centering this on local and expanding the definition of library in people's minds from not just being books and, of course, the evolution in the past 25 years to programs and other types of specific collections like the Library of Things, which includes the tool and seed lending that we do, but also finding the people in our communities who are willing to share their wisdom, just like you folks, uh, and really help their communities be better thanks to that local expertise. So we wanted to focus it in local, and the acronym was just a happy accident. Happy accident. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the queen of puns. I love it. Okay. The books. Now, I said, again, again, my library doesn't participate yet. Is there a posting on the website for Mid-Hudson Libraries where somebody could say, what, you know, I want to know what the gardening books are that are available instead of slogging through and guessing and things? Oh, yeah. So is, was there a section that they would look for? Well, there's two ways. If you want the specific collection we developed just for the Library of Local, there's uh -huh. a website devoted just to the Library of Local. Okay. The, those books are listed right there. Okay, so they would have to know about that. Well, not necessarily, because the kind of power of libraries for the past 200 years has been our ability to organize information. Mm -hmm. And at the Mid-Hudson Library System, we catalog everything in all 70 library buildings across the Hudson Valley. Okay. And we have a naming convention system to do that. So mm -hmm. you can search by subject. You could say, gardening and all the books, not just in the library of local collection, but in all 70 buildings would come up in your search results. Okay. You can pick what you want and have it delivered to your local library. That's how I get my crime novels. Hey. <laughs> okay. How do you decide what's relevant locally? We've got a lot of local authors. We interview a lot of them. Is Who, who does that screening? The curation of the book collection for the Library of Local was done by a committee. Don't we all love working in committees? Mm. But we had a lot of passionate people who know a lot about uh, food security, growing food, preserving food. So our first year we focused just on food. Second year was on climate action. And so that same committee kind of curated titles, ones we knew we could get from a local bookseller. We wanted to really invest that money locally, so we used Oblong Books okay. to source those books. So the books, I think, really speak to the native gardening that we do here in the Hudson Valley, the history of the Hudson Valley, as well as some really, I think, just go-to titles on these topics that are just well, really well-known. So, Rebecca, our 
listeners aren't just gardeners. They have a wide range of interest of things outside their front door. What else might be relevant in the library of local? So we actually uh, was taking a look at the, the title list again, thanks to your interview questions. And there's all sorts of things from foraging to food preservation to climate action work that we're going to be doing, uh, obviously, as part of our future here in the Hudson Valley. And I think a lot of the, the work is really to inspire people to think about how to really live locally and think about what happens when things like the food supply chain breaks down or the delivery system in our country breaks down. And we got a little preview of that during the pandemic. So I think way more people are interested in making sure they can source their own food, um, that they can collaborate together and work well together, and they understand how the natural world around them works to make the most of it for their benefit while not overusing natural resources. So I think there's a wide variety of titles in there that would hopefully be of interest to a lot of different people. So let's say beekeeping. Yeah. Hen keeping? Yes. (laughs) How about mushrooming? Yeah, foraging for mushrooms, yeah. General sustainable living? Absolutely, yeah. What's that? What is that? So I think that's thinking about living off the land, using renewable resources, things that reduce your carbon footprint so that we're not contributing to the greenhouse gas emissions that trigger climate change. We're thinking about where things come from so that we're not over-transporting things, which again is adding to the greenhouse gas emissions that are causing climate change. So you have a library section where people can research that. Is that kind of Absolutely, what yeah. To? Okay, now another one, because I, I get focused when we talk about food. <laughs> canning and things like that. Yeah, absolutely. The library of things. Can I go get my canning gear, all the pots and things, special gear, specialty gear that you need and I, I only use think, once a I year? I don't think so much that stuff. There, there was talk of having canning uh, materials there. We yeah. were concerned about getting too involved in food items that would result in food safety issues. And we felt we didn't necessarily have the expertise to go too deep on that end of the work. So we stuck primarily to gardening tools. So if they come in with a certificate that they took the class at Cooperative Extension, then, then we could set that up. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. Because <laughs> okay. I, know, I know they do a lot, a lot of, of uh, food preservation training with Cooperative Extension. Mm-hmm. Okay. And that stuff's expensive when, you, when you're gearing up. Yeah, I mean, if that's something that might be a good addition, we can certainly talk about it. Yeah. Yeah, we have on staff a master certified master food preserver, and Terry Sennett, one of our volunteers, is also just got her certification, as did a couple of our master gardeners this recent uh, spring. Well, that's really important. I think the growth of that local expertise here in the Hudson Valley is, is really necessary, because I think the future is kind of uncertain. You know, as okay. we see the report that came out on March 20th from the United Nations, They've given us about a decade more to turn things around when it comes to climate change. It's okay for me, but you guys are (laughs) (laughs) And so as we think about that trajectory and the fact that we haven't done a very good job up until now, and when you think about the massive undertaking to turn things around in the next decade, it will take people thinking differently about how we live our lives, where we buy things, where we source things from. And so I think centering that local knowledge here in the Hudson Valley is going to be more of people are going to be looking for that kind of information, turning to experts like Terry, and really thinking about how they live their lives and why they make the choices that they do. So I just think the increased awareness is coming, and these folks are ahead of their time. That is somewhat hopeful. I watched both Seed and Dirt in the last week, and I thought I needed antidepressants <laughs> after those two things. What are those? They're uh, documentaries. Documentaries, okay. yeah. Seed says that we lost over 90% of our seed worldwide in the 20th century. That's okay. We got that place up in the Arctic. Look cool. Still under threat. (laughs) Yeah, but I think that it speaks to those ideas of, I I, I obsess about this idea of how much have we forgotten over the generations? Like things that our society used to know and do on a regular basis that we either automated or streamlined or, you know, Amazon or some other corporation found a solution for us. And we've just allowed ourselves to forget how to do things. Well, it's not even long term. I was talking about paper newspapers. Do you, have you seen a, a wedding announcement lately or an engagement or a birth announcement? We're not, even this within a matter of a few decades, right. 
we've lost so much. Right, it's, it's become so decentralized yeah. across social it's media and how we scattered. think about we only yeah. communicate perhaps in these very small groups of mm. friends and neighbors or family and neighbors. So I think the idea of centralizing our thinking back at the local level, the community level, is really important. And so a lot of the work that libraries are doing today and really got, I think, amplified during the pandemic is how we bring people together as a community. How do you find community in a world that is actively investing billions of dollars to keep you isolated and to purchasing things you don't need uh, and not relying on your neighbors the way you used to? So what we saw in the pandemic was the number one thing people needed from us in the first few weeks of the pandemic was a, a, a real cure for social isolation. Mm-hmm. You know, so we saw like at the Claverack Library just down the road here, the knitting circle on the front yard of the library, like just people were desperate to see each other and be with each other. Yep. And that's going to be very essential as we move forward, as things get tougher and tougher out there. If you can rely on your neighbors, that solves a lot of problems, or at least you'll be able to solve problems together. Well, one of my favorite things about libraries is they're thriving in what I call a post-literate age. It's not just coming in for books. People are coming for so many other things. Yeah. It's phenomenal. Yeah, when we think about we call them the literacies now. Yeah. It used to just be literacy, teaching people how to mm. read. But now we're trying to help people interpret the world around them. So we focus a lot on information literacy. How do you you know, figure out fact from fiction? How do you understand how the natural world works? How do you use technology to your advantage and to make sure that you're not falling for some scam out there? So there's a lot of decoding that needs to happen in our world today, and libraries are a great place to go to for help. Okay, now Annie tells me you're on the road a lot. I am. Tell us the, like the most exotic place you've gone. <laughs> the most in exotic? The Hudson Valley. Oh, in the Hudson some. Valley? <laughs> well, if you've been other where, tell us that too. Well, you know, our system is really big. We have one of the largest library systems in the state, so we cover 3,000 square miles uh, in Columbia Green, as, as well as Ulster, Dutchess, and Putnam County. So I find all of the locales exotic in the Hudson Valley because everyone has such unique stuff to offer, great history throughout the Hudson Valley. But our work in the Hudson Valley has led to me speaking nationally and internationally. So I would say most exotic internationally has been Iceland, where they flew us into this very remote area of the country that at first they canceled our flight because the wind in the fjord was too hard and we couldn't leave the day we wanted to. It was a dicey entry and landing. Adam, my husband Adam is still a little shaken from it two years later, (laughs) but it's awesome just to see the different varieties of how people are thinking about what's going on in the world today and how very different it is. Well, isn't Iceland one of the most literate countries on the planet? They are. They're also very small, and I think books for Christmas. They do. Yeah, yeah. I'm so excited. I'm going to move there. I can't afford to eat there. (laughs) But I think what you see outside of the U.S. is a very different mode of thinking about how we live our lives, uh, what the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals mean for the future. When I've been to Denmark, Greece, Ireland, when I speak to librarians over there, it's just part of their vocabulary that they talk about sustainability. Where here in the U.S., it's been a very heavy lift for me for the past 10 years to get people to even understand what I'm talking about when I say sustainability. And it's just now that I've been able to start talking about climate action in a way that doesn't make everyone get very nervous. So when you think about half of our country maybe voting against the idea idea of working together globally or respecting the United Nations uh, recommendations for what they see across the globe as being necessary. Again, I think focusing things at the local level. So that's why I say that each town in our Hudson Valley is kind of exotic because they have their own flavor. They're doing their own thing. They have their own vision for how they're going to make their town successful. And so I think we respect that by promoting each of their local libraries to be what that community needs it to be. So for the Harry Potter fans, like each library is like a room of requirement where you tell us what your goals are, what your aspirations are, and we design collections and programs and services that speak to that. And I think the Library of Local became an idea that was universal enough that we could spread it across 15 communities. So we saw a lot of demand for that kind of thinking across the Hudson Valley. Okay, so logistics are your only issue. Most libraries are too small. That was the biggest barrier. Yeah, Yeah, we have this beautifully designed kiosk, a local artist, Johnny Pooks, Um, from Rosendale designed these kiosks. They're a thing of beauty, and Mm. they're custom, and they have these drawers for the seeds and little closet for the tools. But most of our libraries didn't have the footprint to add the kiosk in. How do we get one for home? Yeah, right? Mm. I know. It's so beautiful. Um, But it really became a barrier to find the space in our libraries to do that work. So one of our libraries that's the 
most progressive in thinking about food and security and climate action is the Philmont Library, the village of Philmont here in the town of Claverack. And Toby Farley, the director there, is amazing. And she just did not have the space for the kiosk, but the programming she does is top notch. The community garden project she's doing is phenomenal. So we found little ways to um, find investment opportunities for other donors to help support them in the work. Um, We made sure we shared out the list of books, the seeds, the tools, so that any library that wanted to replicate this at the level that was comfortable for their space could do so. So we have a wide-ranging Speakers Bureau of Master Gardeners here in Columbia and Greene Counties, as do, I'm sure, Ulster and Putnam. How do we best tie in to all of the libraries in the system so they're aware we're here and available as resources. Yeah, I'm happy to help promote that. I think a lot of libraries have individually connected. I saw one of my libraries doing a pollinator uh, program this weekend thanks to the Duchess uh, Cornell Cooperative Extension Speakers Bureau. So I think it's a match made in heaven and we can certainly help more libraries be aware of the opportunity to bring your expertise in. So Rebecca, Tim's not here and he likes to end the interviews with about what makes you hopeful? I love that question because I think libraries are beacons of hope in every community that we have. And if we proceed with hope in our future, there's a chance, right? If we live in fear, uh, it makes us shut down and factionalize and act kind of like tribes, uh, which is not conducive to creating a future that's really going to help us all thrive. So I think what makes me hopeful is what I see in our libraries every single day. I see families coming in excited to learn together. I see people of all ages coming to our programs that are just excited to be part of something larger than themselves. And so I find libraries, like I said, I'll say it again, they're beacons of hope. I think they show people that you can be what you need to be in this world. And libraries are there to help support you do it. So that's pretty exciting. How many new people are coming into libraries since, say, since COVID? It's been phenomenal, yeah. We had a phenomenal level of growth during pandemic, Mm -hmm. and in this region, we had two of the top five cities in the country where people moved to during the pandemic. Right. So we got all the refugees. (laughs) Yeah, the pandemic refugees, that's Mm -hmm. right. But it really shifted the demographics of the Hudson Valley. You know, we were seeing a declining population of school-aged children that was totally turned around by this migration during the pandemic. So we're issuing library cards left and right. It's been super exciting to see people find their library and recognize that living in the Hudson Valley is a lot different than living in Brooklyn, and it's a lot more personalized. Okay. So you're getting people who probably belong to a library in Brooklyn. How many are you getting who were not library-oriented? I think the Things like the library of local help bring in folks who didn't realize the library was for them. Okay. You know, a lot of folks, when you ask them, really ask anybody to do word association. I say library, you say book, right? People think books when they yeah. think libraries. And libraries are so much more than that. So when we tap into a vein like this where people are super interested in learning in different ways, not just through books, when they see programming coming out of their library's newsletter and, and finding out what's going on at their library, we see people drawn in and realizing the library is for them, right. that they can learn there even if they're not excited about reading a book on a particular topic. Maybe they are a more kinetic learner. They like to do things hands-on. The library is that place as well. So we are seeing an uptick in folks that maybe don't have a library card to check out an item, yeah. but they're showing up at the programs. They're showing up to help volunteer. Good, because I am astonished in my little woodchuck neighborhood at people who have no idea what the library is for. Mm -hmm. And I'm I'm including the fact that they can go get a book. Mm -hmm. They think that they have to pay for it. There has to be a membership, you know, like for your streaming stuff. Mm -hmm. It's just appalling. I mean, that alone is is motivation for a crusade. Yeah, (laughs) and I think people are shocked when they find out. Not only can you walk in, anyone can walk through the door. There's no charge to get your card. You can use any of the 70 buildings throughout the Hudson Valley to pick up your books or return them at. And then I think when you start... And a pickaxe. Yeah, and a pickaxe, too. So I think the return on investment people are getting through their libraries just keeps growing. We do this program called Real People, Real Dollars, Mm. where folks who do use the library on a regular basis calculate how much they save on an annual basis by using it. Oh, I see it it on my little ticket every time I take it. Yeah, like how smart are you? You know, like every time you're checking out books, you're not buying them, so you're saving money. I think of it slightly differently because Mm. the reality is I would not buy those books. So, or I would not buy many of the books, tapes, audio, everything that I consume through the library. So I think of it as continuing education credits I'm not paying for. (laughs) Uh, Because, yeah, because I I know I would not go spend $9.95 on that DVD, but I am 
so much smarter for having taken it out of the library and watched it and learned something. And different people use a library in different ways. You know, you use the library to borrow a lot of books. And other people come in just to use the computers. Other people just download stuff. Other people just come to the programs. And it just looks different depending on who you are, what you're looking for, what stage of life you're in. I remember one wonderful morning. It was snowing. It was about 15 degrees out. And I finished one of the books in a series I was reading. And I downloaded the next as an <laughs> audio book. <laughs> In my jammies. Instant from gratification. My <laughs> it was a game changer. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> well, thanks, Rebecca. I appreciate you being here today, and we welcome you back another time with more to tell us about libraries, libraries of local, and sustainability here in the Hudson Valley. Yeah. And thank you. I love talking about libraries. Oh, well, thanks so much for having me. I'm, as you can tell, I like talking about libraries, too. <laughs> and thank you for all that you folks do for the community. It's really wonderful that you have the podcast. And the more I get to know about the program, thanks to, to Annie's involvement, I'm just really impressed with it. I didn't really understand the depth of it. Well, thank you. That concludes another episode of Nature Calls, Conversations from the Hudson Valley. We would like to thank Sandra Linnell and Devin Connolly from Cornell Cooperative Extension of Columbia and Green Counties for production support. And a special thank you to our listeners for joining us on this episode of Nature Calls, Conversations from the Hudson Valley. You can find links to any of the topics mentioned in this episode at our website at ccecolumbiagreen.org. Comments and suggestions for future topics may be directed to us at columbiagreenmgb at cornell.edu or on the CCE Master Gardener Volunteers of Columbia and Green County's Facebook page. For more information about Cornell Cooperative Extension of Columbia and Green Counties, visit our website at ccecolumbiagreen.org or visit us in Hudson or in Acre. Cornell Cooperative Extension provides equal programming and employment opportunities 